the commission will come back from its recess and um, Commissioner Tuma would you please repeat your question. Yeah, I won't be rambling this night, uh, but it, it basically is our orders, we want to have some foundation for them. We want to be revisiting them uh, willy nilly. So I asked uh, uh, former Commissioner Lipschultz uh, the, the principle by which I'm going to apply a standard to kind of investigate this filing as we've already given an order, including an EPC prior to the next EPC filing. So, what standard am I applying here today? Madam Chair, Commissioner Tuma, I forgot to say before that's a great question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and see your name. Dan Lipschultz is here on behalf of the MREA and MPA, the joint petitioners. Um, the standard really is whether you have reason to believe that LTD won't be able to actually meet the commitments required for an EPC designation. And that means reason to believe that they won't be able to provide the supportive services throughout the designated area consistent with the public interest, which is the standard. And um, in this case, in our petition, and the other folks who have appeared here as well have laid out a number of uh, facts and information that, has come, that have come to light since your decision a year ago, which leads us to believe in, and we believe gives you cause to initiate a proceeding to look more deeply and determine whether in fact they can meet those commitments or be counted on to meet those commitments which are essential to actually being considered in EPC. And, and for example, and it's all in our petition, LTD has since your decision defaulted on 30% of its bid locations through failure to meet basic EPC deadlines and procedural requirements. Since your decision a year ago, the FCC has no, issued a notice of apparent forfeiture to LTD based on LTD engaging in prohibited contacts during the bidding process. Since your decision a year ago, You've heard complaints and concerns with LTD's fixed wireless service and CAF2 performance discussed in the comments of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and the counties. You also, since a year ago, your decision a year ago, uh, three state commissions in other states have issued orders denying uh, LTD's ETC applications on substantive grounds. And, and, and I'll just lay it out for you, and again, it's all in our petition. The South Dakota Commission, concluded that LTD has not demonstrated that its designation as an ETC will comply with all applicable laws and rules. In particular, LTD's ability to provide the supported services throughout the designated area within a reasonable time frame. So that South Dakota order has detailed findings based on an extensive factual record that led to that conclusion. The Iowa Commission issued an order since your decision a year ago, and I'll quote, the record in this docket does not merit the expansion of a credential that signals to the public that LTD has evidence of the technical and financial capabilities required to carry out the public interest obligations of those entrusted with federal funds. I'll read from the California Commission, which also rejected the LTD ETC application. LTD's management failures to act diligently and honestly, as well as that of its counsel, are more than adequately supported by the record and support denial of LTD's application. The North Dakota Commission denied the ETC application based on the failure to file that application within the time frame required. But what's interesting is the North Dakota Commission staff said, and I'll quote, staff does not believe it is, in, it is in the public interest of North Dakota to grant ETC status to LTD. It is not technically or financially feasible for LTD to build out the necessary infrastructure in the time required by the FCC for RDOF. That's the Regional Digital Opportunity Fund, which is really what's at issue here. This, I'm continuing to quote from the staff of the North Dakota Commission, this would result in the North Dakota locations being ineligible for other funding until such time as the resulting corrective action and or legal proceedings with the FCC have been completed. This would leave these North Dakota customers without other reasonable options for many years in the future. This is obviously not in the public interest, end quote. All of these decisions, by these other state commissions and the other information that I just laid out, and that's just a subset of all the information, give you, I think, compelling cause to initiate an investigation to look more deeply into this and decide on your own, based on the record developed here, whether in fact you think LTD should continue to have that ETC designation, which, by the way, is a public trust. It, 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 it's a designation and, 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 and an opportunity you give them to access substantial public money that's paid for, obviously, by the public. So they look at 
uh, my statutory authority. I, I'm going to basically rely on my 216A broad authority. That's my order, uh, our order uh, that we gave, uh, relying on assertions of LTD regarding their ability to compete in the public interest. And there is substantial new evidence that has arisen to put that in question. Yeah. That's what we're passing on to the ALJ or the committee to make first a determination whether there's sufficient evidence to relook at this. And then evidentiary questions on the relook is, given how we're going to relook at it, what are the evidence that's before us that we're going to lay out? And obviously, you know, I don't want to relitigate the issue, but I want to just procedurally, that's the steps I'm making today. I'm making that determination. There's sufficient evidence to open an investigation to reconsider that prior order. Madam Chair, Commissioner Tuma, that's correct. And then the, then the decision for the commission after the record is developed is whether, in fact, you should revoke that ETC designation. But right now, um, you have information available to you that gives you cause to open an investigation and make a determination on the record developed as to whether their ETC designation should be revoked. And, 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 and there's ample authority, obviously, for this, and you're aware of that. I just want to be kind of focused on what my decision is today. So first is kind of a, a level of uh, consideration to whether I think there's enough evidence to open this back up and start an investigation, even though we have a prior order. I don't think our order should be taken lightly, and so we shouldn't take them lightly either. And so we'll have that discussion. So to Mr. Curran, what do you say um, in response to what my standard is today? I saw your petition saying, hey, we're past recon. I agree with you, we are past recon. So if it was a question about recon, I would agree with you. But now, as you heard Mr. Lipschultz laid out, and a broad, broad authority under you know, 216A, uh, it's my order, and there's information out there that should give me pause to want to investigate uh, sufficient, substantial evidence. What do you say? Good morning, Chair uh, Commissioner Tuma. This is Andy Carlson from the Taft Law Firm representing LTD Broadband. Mr. Coran, I believe, is also on the WebEx. My apologies. Thank you. Um, basically, what you heard Mr. Richold say is uh, that there's uh, that the Commission has to um, come up with reason to believe, or that they think there's reason to believe that LTD might not be able to meet its ETC. Uh, qualifications. That's exactly the same issue that was before you a year ago. Um, everything that, um, re really nothing has changed since then. The commission made its order based on the record that it had before it then. Um, the, the, the rule that applies here is the reconsideration rule. It's titled petition after commission decision. It's, that's exactly what's on point here. And Although the commission has broad authority to uh, reconsider things uh, as may be appropriate, um, this is, would be a really bad way to do that for a bunch of reasons. Um, there is nothing about LTD performance, commitments, or activities as an ETC in Minnesota that has been called into question. LTD has committed last year to comply with ETC compliance obligations. It has done so. There were compliance obligations in last year's order that it did comply with. It is on track with its CAF 2 obligations in Minnesota. It is building out uh, fiber in southern Minnesota in advance of the RDOF process here already. And uh, basically, there is nothing other than legal or procedural arguments from other states Very that is different. Um, in, uh, reopening this proceeding would also be a really poor, uh, a really unwise decision from a policy point of view, because then we'll just be back here anytime any other competitor has complaints or concerns or just a competitive uh, animus against uh, an ETC. You know, um, there are other ETCs in the RDOF process here that use, uh, that also do not have a track record of being uh, ETCs in Minnesota. Maybe next week somebody will have a complaint against one of those, and then you reopen that. Where does it end? Um, the, uh, I think it's telling that petitioners have 
reiterated their focus on the ETC, the Minnesota ETC rule, 7811, 1400, and 7812, 1400, which plainly, and has already been decided, um, apply only to uh, local change carriers and so forth, not to LTD. Um, finally, I would uh, note that, as Sack pointed out in his briefing papers, any inquiry that sort of reopens or seeks to revoke LTD's ETC designation um, kind of carries with it implicitly the question about the scope of the commission's authority and jurisdiction over ETCs, an issue, a non-certificated ETC such as LTD, an issue which has kind of been hanging in that other docket 2186, and it would be putting the cart before the horse to start some sort of inquiry to revoke based on a standard that is not established yet and that is, could be established in that docket. Uh, perhaps the most important reason, last year the commission found that designating um, LTD as an ETC would uh, be good public policy because it would allow $311 million in federal funding to come to Minnesota and uh, the entire enterprise that petitioners are trying to do here to revoke LTD's ETC designation would jeopardize that. It would jeopardize that major infusion of federal funds, which the commission found last year was consistent with and supportive of Minnesota's broadband goals. So um, for all those reasons, although there is sort of a, a amorphous statutory authority for the commission to um, exercise broad authority in some instances. There's no factual basis that uh, supports that being done here. Um, the legal basis that they've cited is not on point, it's questionable, and uh, mostly as a matter of public policy, it'd be unwise as a commission precedent, and it would be unwise from a broadband build-out policy point of view. Let me just straighten out here, I mean, what I'd like your response to this. Uh, when we made our determination before, and I agree with you as on the promise of uh, several millions of dollars coming to <coughs> census blocks that were going to serve. Um, and since then, it seems to be, and I'm hearing from local entities, counties, and, and local governments uh, that are saying townships uh, were involved and saying, look, we get blocked. services through either state grants or even a new federal grant that's coming through, which doesn't have to get an ETC designation. The best that I can tell that it's going through the Department of Commerce and not FCC. And therefore, we're worried about an essential blocking effort and the next six to uh, 10 months could be critical for us in getting that services out to communities that are ready and willing to work with others so what would be your response to that? LTD is absolutely uh, dedicated to and focused on getting service out to those areas as soon as it is authorized and has funds and everything to do so. The allegations which I think uh, sort of emanate at their start from petitioners but I have, are echoed in the comments of local municipalities and so forth, that there's sort of a, a blocking type of thing going on are incorrect in the sense that there is no, um, well first, there's nothing stopping people from building out in these areas with their own money. The only blocking is to get some other grant or some other program. Uh, but that's a, that would be to get things that are coming up in the future. There is no, it's way ahead of schedule to say there would already be something in the ground. This would be to get, be qualified or to have an area be eligible to get a grant 
and then a year from now the money gets spent or whatever uh, years down the road it, it wouldn't go as fast as those uh, complaints are suggesting and uh, the bottom line is that the RDOF program is designed by the FCC to provide service in these underserved or unserved areas and it was the first one that came along um, other entities could have participated in the auction. Um, many of the places in Minnesota, I believe more than half that LTV was the winner in the auction on, no one else bid it. So um, uh, there were opportunities for others to be involved. Um, the program is designed or the or overall uh, broadband uh, uh, funding program is designed so that there's not duplicative funds going multiple you know, multiple rounds of funding going to the same place. Um, so, you know, the RDOT program goes as fast as the FCC is moving it. And I, I would say that those complaints, uh, LTV's responses, LTV is dedicated to serving those areas as soon as possible. And beyond that, the concerns that those folks have are not concerned about LTV's performance or uh, uh, eligibility to be an ETC. Um, there are concerns that are just implicit in the way the overall system is created, which is not an issue that LTV or anyone else, you know, that's not before us today. Sure. Uh, you know, I think the local government response to that, that you know, moving off the block. Before I do that, I do want to get the department and, and, and OHE's thoughts on my authority today. What is that authority moving forward? You've indicated think we should open an investigation and uh, that you believe that we do have authority to do that even though it was prior order. So I just want to make sure I'm tracking, I'm, I'm thinking it's my broad authority under, under 216A, uh, it's my order and there's substantial new evidence to put in question the order that I had decided even though we're past the time. So is that what you understand and then you still support given what you've heard today, support us going forward with it? Good morning, Chair Steven, uh, Commissioner Tuma. Uh, my name is Richard Thornfeld, the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. I'm here today on behalf of the Department of Commerce. Um, and, and that's right. Uh, the allegations that have been raised in the petition by MPA, my local governments, are in the department's view, we warrant further investigation, particularly given the amount of money involved, the number of locations impacted, and the importance of ensuring that all Minnesotans have access to high speed, reliable internet. Um, the department supports taking a second look at that. And, and I think you're right. That whether you want to think of this as a recon petition or the commission on its own motion, you know, reopening a matter or just sort of refining this petition, I don't think there's any dispute about the commission's ability to, to proceed with this matter. The, the commission is not a court. You, know, you don't make a decision and just move on. The commission has an ongoing regulatory relationship with the entities that are within its jurisdiction. And that means that it's an ongoing process. As new facts arise, the commission you know, takes a fresh look at it. And this is new information, and the department views that it's important to take a fresh look at it. We should take it lightly. I think we should be, once you make an order, we should kind of live with it. But there should be at least some standard. We can go back and look at it. And that's the position we're going to take. Uh, Ms. Burkholz, real quickly. Burkholz, please state your name for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner Sullivan. This is Kristen Berkland, and I'm appearing today on behalf of the Minnesota Office of the uh, Attorney General, Residential Utilities Division. And I, I echo everything uh, that Mr. Dornfeld said. I, I'm happy to address the other points that were raised if the commission would like me to, but I also don't want to unnecessarily uh, prolong the, the agenda meeting here today. I will say on the subject of Docket 2186, that is something entirely different than what is happening here today. The, the question here today is should we open a proceeding to look at whether LTV is the right choice for Minnesota? Designation and revocation are ultimately about do we want this person operating here? Do we want to let them in the door or once they're in the door do we think we need to usher them back out? Docket 2186 assumes 
that we have decided that that EPC, that company is the right choice, is a right EPC for Minnesota, and now we're looking at other aspects of their participation in federal universal service. Um, and it, with other than that, I would just echo Mr. Dornfeld to say, you know, ETC designations are not static. That would make no sense to give an ETC designation to someone for a 10-year period and then say, what's done is done. Under no circumstances can we ever look at new information, nor should we look at new information, I think is just wrong both uh, from a federal universal service perspective and from that ongoing regulatory relationship that Mr. Dornfeld referenced. And with that, I will address other things if you would like me to. Thank you. Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'd kind of like to hear from the local units of government just the response to LTD uh, about this is all perspective, uh, you know, uh, the blocking issue and the public interest issue is conjecture, uh, I guess. So, what do you say? Good morning, ma'am. Who is your microphone on? I, I think it is. Is it? Can you hear me? Yeah. It must be because the okay. camera went on you, so that's, right, that's we'll an indication. Can you hear me now? Yes, and please state your name. Yes. Barbara Jair Klein, I'm a resident of Lucer County, a consultant on broadband. I uh, moved back from California six years ago. I found that we had frontier dial up, and I've been involved with this ever since. Um, fortunately, my issue is easily resolved. I was a quarter mile from Viper and paid for it myself. Uh, I've been working with our county, which is a small rural county. We don't have a huge infrastructure there. We have farmers, we have businesses scattered about. And um, we have been working really hard for five years to look at how can we improve on broadband in our area. We were very successful with our first board to board application in 2019 for two townships, fiber to every door. And we moved ahead and did another application in, which went in in 2020 for, for two more townships. That application for Another 247 households was denied by the state because of the RDOF issue. And this is our RDOF map. We are, it, it's Swiss cheese. So for other providers to come in and figure out what, what can be done here in the meanwhile is incredibly difficult. We have gone ahead and we're in the process of resubmitting one of the applications from last time. And the cost is now $400,000 more than the last time for the same households, for the same maps. And we worked really closely with Christopher Mitchell here and looked at our previous board and board application and what the costs are versus what the dollars are per census tract. And we're gonna have real questions about where is all the other money gonna come from to support the small amount of money awarded to LTD for the census tracts in our county. Just to follow up, Ms. Dreyer Klein, when you said when you work with Lister County to submit an application. I'm oh, sorry. What was that application for and for what entity? Thank you. We worked with DevCom and MetroNet, which used to be Jaguar. They submitted the applications and we worked intensively with them in, uh, and, and also contributed financially to those applications. And to the, to the Department of To the Board of the Border applications, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Green. Um. I just want to make sure too that when you said you didn't get the grant, what what block grant specifically said? The state determined that that um, applications that had LTD census check, RDOT census checks, and they were not eligible for funding. And I think that's the public interest argument, Mr. Lipschultz, that the your, your uh, folks made on page 23 of your briefing, that it's not just about the possible loss of RDOT money. Concerning you from a public interest standpoint, and your staff in the briefing paper said there's no guarantee we're going to get this money. Uh, your folks are willing to take that risk, I understand, of losing this RDOF pool of money uh, based on a public interest that is blocking, as has happened and may happen going forward. Madam Chair, Commissioner Goodwin, that's correct. It's that blocking, and that's, that's kind of a core public interest that really motivated our mission. And let me just add quickly, uh, I, I can't let it stand that somehow our petition is motivated by competitive animus. 
Um, one of the petitioners, the MREA, is comprised of 50 nonprofit electric cooperatives. Less than five of them even provide broadband, and one or two of them apply for RDOF credits. They're in this proceeding because, uh, for the same reason as the Sword County, ILSR, and others, they want to get high speed broadband out to their unserved rural communities. And right now, we believe LTD will not be able to do that, and in the meantime, LTD's potential award is blocking access to other sources of funding to bring it to those areas. Madam Chair, I want to move on to process and, and, uh, and also the uh, long form, but I don't want to, if others have questions on public interest and uh, kind of what our posture is, I don't want to interfere with that before I jump into that. Please. Commissioner Sullivan. Thank you, Chair Stephen. I have a question for Mr. Carlson. Mr. Carlson, you said that really nothing has changed um, from our original determination. And I'd like you to respond to, I mean, it, it seems like a lot has changed. I mean, three commissions, uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, and California, at least three that have uh, rejected the LTD's request for DTC designation. Uh, Mr. Litchfield's indicated that 30% of your bid locations have been defaulted on thanks to service. I mean, how do you respond to that? Thank you, Chair, Mr. Sullivan. Um, what I was trying to say is that nothing has changed with regard to Minnesota to begin with. There's no record of anything in terms of ETC compliance, ETC obligations, ETC commitments in Minnesota that's different than it was a year ago. Um, at the same time as this commission a year ago was um, working on ETC designation for the RDOF uh, auction uh, winner, um, other states were doing the same. Other states using different standards and developed records, which no one did or asked to do in this proceeding, uh, uh, and basically coming down in South Dakota, which is really the only one that's talked about in the petition in any meaningful way, um, uh, that basically boils down to one consultant and uh, a two to one vote by the commission that they thought that that consultant's testimony about LTDs uh, capability was convincing. We obviously strongly disagree with the, that consultant's point of view, um, but you know the, the defaults that are referred to are essentially the same thing as the ETC designations not being granted um, in terms of the service areas. So um, uh, there's nothing that uh, past that that changes LTC LTD's commitment, its readiness. Um, to perform its commitment as an ETC in Minnesota. And in fact, uh, the record shows that LTD has been doing the things that it's promised to do in Minnesota. It's on track or ahead with CAP2 build out. And as I mentioned before, already deploying fiber. And um, those uh, items in those other states are just not, uh, you know, they use a different legal standard and they're frankly focused on the wrong thing. If you look at the South Dakota um, order, you'll see that they have a, a sort of a public interest rule, which there is no parallel rule in Minnesota that focuses on impact to incumbents and other factors that are not really the thing that anybody should be focused on in ETC designation, especially in the broadband uh, mode that we're in now. That, that rule, that public interest standard that they applied was developed 15, 17 years ago uh, when the concern was wireless carriers and ETCs and their effect on incumbents. Um, though, you know, basically the, what I'm trying to say is there's nothing that materially changes LTD's commitment or record of performance in Minnesota. And I wanted to just respond to one thing that Ms. Ber Berkman said, which is that, um, you know, there shouldn't be some standard that, you know, nothing can change after 10 years. That's not at all LTD's position. As the, Commission well knows there is already a rigorous process that exists to certify ETCs once they're receiving funding and make sure that everything is going okay. Uh, the department is active in that. OAC is often active in that. It happens every year. We're not at that stage. Uh, nothing. LTD has not gotten any money yet. Um, but when the uh, time is right, that process is in place, and that's an appropriate place to. 
uh, review any concerns about LTD's performance. And so it's not like we, you know, this doesn't need to be reopened to address that. Nothing has happened in Minnesota yet to be addressed. If something happens, there's already a forum in place to address it. Um, I Oh, I was just going to say, is that process after the, the long form application has been accepted or denied right, but by the... Well, if it's denied, I'll let him finish his Thank you, I apologize. Um, uh, yes, um, first, the long form application has to be authorized by the, FD, uh, by the FCC for LTD to be eligible to receive funding. Um, that is not complete yet. We're waiting on that. LTD is very anxious for that to be done, wants that to be done as soon as possible so that the process, process can move forward as soon as possible. But that has not happened yet. Anything we were to do today wouldn't have any bearing on that determination, would it? Thank you. Um, because in Minnesota, you are still still have your, you know, you're still designated as an ECC. Uh, that's correct that uh, at present, uh, LTD is designated as, as an ECC in Minnesota. Of course, the point of the petition is to revoke that, which would, um, I'm not frankly sure that I can say exactly what the FCC may or may not think about whatever may happen in this proceeding. Um, the FCC has its own set of criteria that it's using to assess the long form uh, application. Um, uh, you know, I, I'm not quite sure what the impact would be. I don't think it would be, I don't think it could be considered positive if the, this commission were to pursue some effort to revoke or, or authorize opening a proceeding even to uh, revoke the ECC designation. Thank you. Ms. Berkland, I know um, you have extensive experience with in telecom matters and certainly we, I appreciate your um, your analysis of this docket and the work on behalf of the Attorney General in this case. And I do um, have some concerns that if the commission would move forward with an investigation and ultimately we would reject LTD's ECC status, would those, would there be any assurance that the Three hundred and some million dollars would come back to Minnesota. Madam Chair, thank you for that question. No, the any unawarded funds from RDOF one are going to be rolled into an RDOF two. So RDOF one is for unserved areas. That's the focus of the funds, and RDOF two is is could also be unserved areas, but is primarily focused on underserved areas. Uh, and so the money would roll from RDOF 1 to RDOF 2. It would be re-auctioned. It's, it's likely that some Minnesota providers will participate in the RDOF 2 auction via, and be awarded funds. But dollar for dollar, that $311.8 million, no, there's no guarantee that that would come back to a Minnesota provider. So Ms. Brooklyn, then, at your representing the Minnesota Attorney General's office, all of us up here, and the Department of Commerce are advocating for Minnesota. And we want as much money to come to serve underserved or unserved areas in Minnesota. So help articulate to me why proceeding with this investigation is the right thing to do for Minnesota as a state. Thanks, Madam Chair. The reason for that is just as dangerous as the 311.8 million moving to RDOF 2 and potentially not coming to a Minnesota provider, if having the 311.8 million be awarded and the, the commitments made for that money not being carried out. I, and I wanna be clear here, my, in supporting the proceeding, I'm not making a prejudgment about LTV and what it can or can't do or whether it will do what it has said it will do. I merely have looked at what has been filed in the record. I myself have watched things that have occurred 
since the original ETC designation was made, and I simply have questions about them. It doesn't mean that we would get to the end of a proceeding and I would say revoke the designation. It's simply I have questions and I want a chance to ask them. And frankly, I think it's to LTP's benefit to be able to answer them in a public forum with record evidence that everyone can look at. You know, one of the things that I find particularly compelling here is that when we looked at this last time as a group, the factual record was not terribly well developed. And while I didn't offer them the full and complete factual record for me to look at, I don't know what that record will tell me, but I have questions and I would like those questions answered because I don't want Minnesota consumers to think they will get the benefit of $311.8 million and then not actually see the benefit of that money. And, you know, with my background, particularly with USAC and auditing and reviewing and everything else that I did there, it's a concern. Waste, fraud, and abuse in the federal universal service programs is a problem, and it always has been. Thank you, Ms. Berkland. And turning to the department, Mr. Dornfeld, your page three of your filing, I think, hit home for me in which you wrote allegations that an ETC may not be able to fulfill its federal universal service obligations because of a deficiency in its technical, managerial, or financial circumstances merit serious scrutiny. And it is important that interested parties, including the ETC itself, have an opportunity to analyze and respond to those allegations. Isn't that like the crux of what the department is saying and why it's important for, why you're advocating for the commission to move forward on this, on a procedural basis here to look into these allegations? Sure, Stephen, that's correct. Like the Residential Utilities Division, as Ms. Berkland stated, the department is interested in prejudging the matter, but there's some serious allegations that have been made that warrant further investigation. And, you know, on the one hand, we're weighing what's the risk of loss of funds. On the other hand, there's the risk that LTP broadband is incapable of delivering on its commitments to Minnesotans. And I think at this point, the commission and the department have a pretty good understanding of what happens if there's a loss of funds. It goes back into the RDOF fund, there's going to be a second round of bidding or a second auction. But I don't think that anyone at this stage can say with any certainty about what the probability of LTP's ability to deliver on its obligations are today based on the information that's been raised in the petition. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, let's move into discussions about process then and the procedure that's within option three through the rest of them. And Commissioner Tuma, you wanted to ask about that. Yeah, Mr. Carlson, it seems to me, I think it was pointed out already, you're an ETC. And the designee to do that here in Minnesota, you will continue to be an ETC probably until this is resolved. Whether it seems like the fastest this commission could go by a committee, and frankly, we have not done a lot of it, so we're sitting there trying to figure out, can we really speed it up? But it seems like even the timeline they laid out is going to be probably end of the year. ALJ, this good ALJ, could probably crank it out in about the same amount of time, maybe early next year. In the meantime, you're still an ETC as far as the state's concerned, and the FCC is going to have to address what they're going to do with their long form independent of what we do. But at some point, they're going to come together in a final decision towards the end of the year or the beginning of next year. Again, I'm not an FCC watcher. You probably understand it better than I do. But it seems like they're all going to come together about the same time, and you're not going to be able to get your people on the ground any quicker or sooner doing this, whether it's an ALJ or some process here. Am I misstating what I'm seeing here, or is there something that you want to highlight for me if we choose to continue investigation, why it should be ALJ or some other process? Mr. Carlson, 
Thank you, uh, Chair, Commissioner. Uh, in terms of the process, um, I don't think it's necessarily the case that it will take that long until the end of the year or next year for the FCC to make a decision. I just can't, I, I can't say if it, could, it could be tomorrow, it could be a year from now. I just can't assume that it will be roughly around the end of the year. Um, I agree that um, uh, the processes that have been laid out, each of them take a few months at the very fastest. Um, we are very concerned uh, and if you think about what the nature of this proceeding would be, very concerned uh, about several things that uh, could happen there that could, I mean, basically the petitioners have, you know, repeatedly sought to intervene or, or file comments opposing uh, LTV's um, designation or the FCC's review of the um, long form. The, you know, at, at both uh, Ms. Berkland and Mr. Dornfeld and, and Chair Steven talked about an opportunity to lay out. There's never going to be a time when it's laid out. Everybody says, okay, that was fine. We are very concerned that it's just going to be forever investigational. What about this? What about that? And that's, that's a big concern. The more time that the company had to spend on whatever the procedure is that the commission may deem appropriate, the less time it can spend uh, getting ready for, or hopefully as soon as possible, putting fiber in the ground. Um, you know, uh, so th those are some of the reasons from a procedural point of view that we just wanted to go as quick as possible. The OIH proceeding is uh, a more of a known quantity, uh, under an, uh, an established process, which seems uh, preferable for that reason. Um, but the main thing is for it to go fast and not allow for disruption uh, investigation into proprietary information, you know, um, essentially, if you think about what this proceeding would be, it's like an analysis of uh, does LTV have the, are LTV's plans realistic? Well, it's very easy for somebody else to say, uh, I don't think they're going to spend enough money here. I don't think they have that figured out enough. Um, that's a very judgment intensive, fact intensive uh, analysis. There's going to be experts. There was an expert in South Dakota. Um, and it's just kind of a, an endless sort of fishing expedition to find something wrong with LTV. And that, that's, you know, I know your question is about procedure, but that's a, that's a very big concern of ours whenever procedure is chosen. Um, Mr. Carlson, I think we're, we've got the answer. Mr. Lynn Schultz, uh, I saw your timelines and I, I, would, I would relish the opportunity if I could be the committee and pull you out of order on something, but uh, it seems like the, the, <laughs> the, the ALJs kind of set up for some of this, and it seems to be very fact intensive. I mean, I know there's a lot of judgment intention here, but there is a lot of fact information. I recall from the original uh, proceeding we had that uh, MTA was willing to bring forward expert witnesses to testify and it just seemed to be out of place at that time. But it seems to me that just falls into the ALJ arena. The reason you laid out a, 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 an aggressive timeline, I mean, uh, time intensity, I, I just think an ALJ in some ways is ready and more quickly to be able to respond to that than the structure we could create here in the committee. And I know you advocated for the committee, I kind of see your, your thought behind it, but it just seems to me everybody's motivated to move quickly, and if you get a good ALJ, which most of them are over there, I think the scheduling conference is going to, you know, uh, be more productive early on because they're ready to do it. How am I thinking wrong? Yeah, and, and, and if you're always free to tell me wrong, I'm thinking wrong. It just seems to make more sense to me at this stage. But help me out. Why? Why would we want to start a process? Madam Chair, uh, Commissioner Kuma, first of all, I'll admit that the thought of you as a presiding officer scared me. Um, uh, um, and, and, and I understand that it's a big ask to ask the Commission to handle this um, as an expedited proceeding and take on the work that the ALJs would otherwise do. No one would understand that better than I do. Our thinking was that this is time sensitive in the sense that we want to clear the decks one way or the other so that everybody knows what's available and what isn't available. And um, no matter how you slice it, no matter how motivated both parties might be to move quickly, 
there is additional process built into a contested case that adds time and variably to the, to the proceeding that you would trim away if you were to handle it in-house on an exped as an expedited proceeding under 23761. Um, there's just, for example, the 30-day time frame of waiting for an ALJ recommended decision, and then there is an additional, usually four weeks, uh, for process to um, allow exceptions to the ALJ report. Um, and and, and it, you know, it grows, and, and it's you know, three, four, five, six months, in my experience, longer than it would otherwise be. Having said that, you know, our main concern is to make sure you get a full record. And, and, and I think that's your, your that, that's that's your thinking. I think Commissioner Kuba behind your question. And, and and at the end of the day, what whatever you think is the best process to produce a quality record is the process you should use. As much as we would like an expedited proceeding to move this more quickly and to allow, I think, uh, and to make the process more accessible to folks like the counties and ILSR, uh, you know, th that would be preferable still. Um, but but I understand uh, where your thinking is coming from. And, and, and so we still would recommend an expedited proceeding. We think that's more conducive to broader participation and we think it'll move faster. But you know, the focus should be on developing the best record possible. Ms. Birkeland and Ms. Dorn Mr. Dornfield, I'll let you play commissioner. Okay, you've heard the <laughs> arguments. Uh, you have to make a decision uh, expedited within the commission, ALJ proceeding, what would you do? Sure, sure Stephen, uh, Commissioner Kuma. The department's preference is an OAH proceeding, given the familiarity with that process. Um, the department also views an adversarial process as, as the best path forward, where we're going to get discovery by non-governmental agencies, where there's going to be cross-examination of witnesses, just to produce a full record. Um, but if the commission decides to proceed with a hearing officer here at the commission, the department's not opposed to that. Thank you, Mr. Berkeley, how would you vote? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, Commissioner Tuma. Um, it's always nice to get an on the spot motion. Uh, you know, there there are definitely advantages to an ALJ proceeding. I think my preference, having kind of heard the party speak, would be for a contested case proceeding with the ALJ, just because I think it will develop the full record. But as with the department, you know, my goal here is to be as flexible as possible to get you the record that you need uh, to, to make the decision that you feel comfortable making. So preference is contested case with an ALJ, but I am also, um, the OAG is also open to the expedited, if that's better for the commission. Commissioner, are you further questions? Not on that, I just one more question. Okay, Bernie, go ahead. Decision option 10. Uh, Mr. Carlson, um, you heard the party that wanted to get the longest one. I think it's a beginning point to speed this up. My assumption is we got it in South Dakota. Uh, is there a problem why we wouldn't we wouldn't be discovered here and then we couldn't be proceeding along? Uh, or are you gonna fight that and I would then defer to the ALJ, but if, if, if there's an open to get the long form and get it, uh, an agreement with the parties and what they can look at it would seem to make sense and so are you still opposed to 10 or what is your opinion of 10 i guess i, I should ask that first uh, definitely opposed to 10 because 10 as i understand it is just handed over right now in general to the commission um, it, you're right that it was produced in discovery subject to a protective order in south dakota uh, extremely involuntarily and um, the reason for that is because it has all sorts of confidential, technical, or financial information in it. Um, uh, if the commission orders uh, a proceeding to be open and refers it to the OAH or whatever process the commission comes up with, um, and it is uh, a thing that has to be addressed in discovery, uh, we will work through that then, including a protective order, um, just sort of turning it over, which is what I understand the petition to, to ask for in the first place, uh, is uh, we are extremely opposed to. Would you be opposed to uh, filing a trade secret uh, and allowing the OAG and the DOC to look at it and then have the question about uh, its availability to other parties to be dealt with by the OAG? Um, haven't specifically considered that particular uh, 
arrangement, but I think probably yes. Uh, one reason is that the uh, information in the long form application is a work in progress. And I don't, uh, am not in a position to myself to say, you know, uh, it's ready to turn over at some point in time to FCC ask follow up questions uh, and so forth. So um, I, I frankly have to talk to the client about that. Well, that to me, uh, you know, I don't know if you need some time to, to talk to them. Uh, I understand the competitive sense of it, sensitivity. I get that. I mean, you don't want to be stealing your competitors' uh, information that they may be able to use down the road. And I would want an ALJ to be very careful to review what can and cannot be looked at and, and discovered. That would make sense to me. But when I look at my two public interest uh, advocates here, the department and the OAGs, they don't have a competitive interest. And having them on board looking at it early on, Chair, I don't know if we can just take a couple of minutes for an object of this line to see if that's okay. I would I think um, put yourself together along that line. I think um, that's wise and it will also give us commissioners time to check in with our attorneys on um, Canon 11 as well. Uh, so the commission will. Mr. Schultz, you had something along that. We're going to. There are a lot of people who will just are saying they want to talk. So if you have a specific question, no no I don't have a concern with that I guess but that's but I'll just note that decision option 10 uh, requires that they file um, their long form uh, such to terms of an approved protective order and the protective order that we provided as an example was based on the South Dakota protective order that they used and it would not allow the competitors of LTD to see it it would be limited to counsel and the independent expert witness. Okay, the commission will stand in recess for 10 minutes.